Our guest today is Tibi Kovash. Tibi, how are you, sir? Yeah, I'm fine, thank you, David. How are you? I'm doing great. It's great to see you again. Uh, last time I, we talked, spoke, I was at your house in yes. uh, uh, Helsingborg, I think. Yes. And uh, now you're uh, you're in Stockholm right now, just sort of hanging out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but a lot's changed. Yeah. A lot's yeah. changed. Congratulations on your new job. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, for people that are, you know, that 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 saw the last episode, I was at the time I was CTO for a company based in Copenhagen. In the meantime, I joined the, you know, the the blue side. I know people used to call it the dark side. Me included. <laughs> but once you get there, you realize it's not the dark side. It's the blue side. <laughs> it's changed a lot. <laughs> yeah. Satya and I have changed it a lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've got my uh, I've got my Copenhagen colors on right now. Oh, yeah. nice. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And um, what sort of things are you doing for Microsoft now? So my official role, I think it's a PMM, you know, my product marketing manager. It's, a, you know, what you would find in the HR database. But the title is actually Azure um, Developer Audience Engage Lead. So in other words, I need to make um, the developers very happy about Azure, you know, to, uh, to excite them about what Azure has to offer. And I've been doing that for a very long time, as you know. I've been doing yeah. that as a community, uh, you know, as part of the community. I've been an MVP, I've been a regional director. Uh, but now I get to do that and I get to be, be paid for it, you know. That, That's that, crazy, it's right? a, Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. I've, I've been doing that for free for a very long time. But now I, that's the only thing I will do. And that, that makes actually a lot of sense. Uh, it says community, but actually it gets to, I, I'll get to be involved with a lot of things. I'll get to do a lot of work with, you know, with the partners, with the customers directly, and try to make sure that you know, they understand what Azure has to offer. I know you've been involved in the, in the open hacks in the past. So yeah. I would actually looking for all the open hacks that will be organized in Sweden. They are, you know, I will be the, the responsible for them, which makes it very, it makes it a very interesting um, um, position. So I'm, I'm very happy about it. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, you were telling me about um, some a project you were working on recently that, that involved GitHub Actions. I know a little bit about GitHub Actions, but not very much. Tell, tell me about that project and how. So well, actually, before, me, I, before you start, tell yeah. me what GitHub Actions are. So a GitHub action is actually a way for you to uh, to create, you know, in, in Azure they are called the, 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 the Azure pipelines. So there are a set of um, instructions, a set of scripts, let's call them scripts because that's what they are at the end of the day, that can get executed when something happens, you know, with your repository. Like if you do a pull request or if you push something, then you can trigger those. So one, you know, one uh, typical example would be if you want to do stuff like continuous integration or continuous deployment. So in a continuous integration uh, scenario, as soon as you do a pull request, you want to make sure that the code that you are committing, it's compiling and it does all the things. And once you're done, with, you know, once you're happy with that, then you can say, yes, this, this step it's done. So then we can move on and maybe have code reviews. So if the code doesn't compile, why would you start doing a code review? Because it doesn't make any sense. So you want right. to do this in an automated fashion. And again, you might want to run your unit tests as, as part of this. So the, the one thing you would do, it's a, you know, it's a YAML based uh, uh, approach. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a very big fan of YAML, but because this is a very space sensitive kind of thing. So if you forgot to space somewhere and it doesn't work the way oh, it should. But um, uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a YAML based language where you specify exactly you know, you can create different jobs and then each job has different steps. And then on those steps, you specify the actions that, that you want to do. And those actions are predefined. So actually the whole thing, it's called the workflow. The bigger, the bigger, uh, you know, the bigger picture is called the workflow. And then you have the actions are, that are the, you know, part of the individual steps that you are doing. And the way I got into those was actually pretty interesting. Uh, there, was a, uh, there was a hackathon called uh, Hack the Crisis that happened about three months ago in, in Sweden. Yeah. And um, I, I signed up as a mentor. And while being a mentor on that, uh, I've seen one of my friends, you know, that he was actually doing some hacking. And I, I just uh, contacted him and said, hey, hi, Magnus, how are you? I'm oh, fine, I'm working on this. And we start looking at, I start looking at I what he was I know doing. Your uh, um, it's not Magnus Mortensen. It's another oh. Magnus. You might have, you might have met Magnus at, uh, actually at, at DevSum in the past. His name is Magnus Thor. You know, so okay. Thor, you know, like the the the, the god of thunder. So he, <laughs> so he, that was actually, you know, that's his actual name. The most yeah. Scandinavian name ever. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, so talking with Magnus, he showed me that what he was doing. It was 
essentially it was a peer-to-peer -peer communication platform. Uh, the, I would call it serverless, but it's not really serverless because you still need a server just to establish the, to establish the connection. But once you get started, actually you don't need a server. So you are never dependent on, on Zoom or, you know, or a central server or, you know, or a team central server in order to be able to communicate with the other person. And I really mm. like that. But what he was mm. doing there, he was deploying that in a manual fashion into the digital, into a DigitalOcean uh, subscription. And I'm like, you know, I, I'm not very familiar with DigitalOcean, but let's see if we can do something about it in, um, in Azure. Mm. And, you know, like friends don't let friends do the right click deploy. I did that <laughs> actually. I did a right click deploy and say, let's see how I can take the, the you know, a, uh, a Node.js application and just deploy it into, into Azure. And while doing that, I got a, you know, I got, you know, I got it deployed into an Azure web app. It worked without any issues. And then going into the deployment center, I see one thing that it says, okay, you can do an Azure DevOps or you can try GitHub Actions. I'm like, okay, so this is on GitHub. Let's see what that is. I had no idea what that would mean for me. So I did a GitHub Action and then all of a sudden I got a, you know, I got a workflow uh, created for me in my own repository or actually in, in his own repository that he would be able to, uh, you know, that everything would be done and it would be connected to my uh, Azure account. Now, looking at the application, it took, I, I don't think it took more than 15 to 20, let's say half an hour to get everything up and running in Azure, which was impressive in itself. You know, like the first time I saw an application, I haven't done anything on it. I haven't prepared anything. It was just a pure Node.js application with Express.js, with WebSocket support and all those things. And I, I, you know, like in less than half an hour, I had it up and running in, in Azure. And with the, you know, with the help of a GitHub action, I had already a, uh, a continuous integration um, uh, pipeline created, or actually even continuous deployment because it was the whole thing, even putting it in production. So mm -hmm. I, was, I was impressed. And then looking at the application, I realized that I, I don't actually need a web application. I don't need to pay a standard, you know, application for it because with a basic uh, SKU for it, it actually did my my uh, my work. I didn't. I don't need any scalability because I only need okay. the, the server, you know, to establish the connection. Everything else are static files. So what the best way to do it than just to put it into a storage account and then connect that storage account into a CDN? So I was looking at you know on a storage account you can do the static website, um, not a static web app, but a static website. So I created a static website and I connected that to a CDN and everything worked perfect. Now, the only problem I had, like how can I automate the, you know, the deployment of my application, of the client side from the, uh, from the server, uh, from the server side to the, um, you know, to, to the storage account. And I started looking around and I found some actions. There is a marketplace actually, and there are a lot of actions there. And I found <laughs> one which did what I needed. But the Great. problem was that he did it in a, in an, I would say, suboptimal way. Um, okay. So now thinking about it, the way the way actually the GitHub Actions are implemented is pretty straightforward. They they are creating uh, containers, and inside a container they have certain uh, software installed. So you can say, I want to start from a Node uh, JS container, I want to start from a .NET container, you know. So or I I would have a uh, you know a basic container, and I would install some software in it prior to doing the the steps that I need to do. But the one thing that you get always, you get a, uh, you, you get a Node.js container. The one that I using as an inspiration was actually, it was written, written as a .NET application. And I didn't like the fact that I had to actually compile the application every time I want to do a deployment because it doesn't feel, you know, the right way to do it. So I'm, I'm thinking the only thing I need to do is actually just, just get it and then deploy it on Azure. And I know that there is a Node.js SDK for, for uh, you know, for working with storage accounts. So why not using that? So starting to look into that, how I can do it and how I, you know, it like I started to work on that. Uh, now there are templates you can use and you can start with the TypeScript, but the, you know, the, the fact that my action was so, I would say so simple because at the end of the day, I don't think I have more than 150 lines of code in the whole action. It took a couple of days to fix it. So it's not like, like oh yeah, you, you write that in, in five minutes. No, it took some time to, to arrive to the point where I want to have it. Mm -hmm. But once I got there, actually, you know, I could just follow the, I tag along with the existing uh, action and just use, you know, the one-on-one, the -on -one, like the parameters were the same for, for what I needed to use. And then I deploy that and then just work. 
And the way you deploy an action in you know, GitHub action, you just create a repository and you have a, in the root, you have an action YAML file and that's it. So the repository name is actually the name of your action. So it's very, you know, it's very straightforward to, to use that and it's very straightforward to, to have it working in, uh, um, you know, with, with, with GitHub. So when you say you were, uh, you were creating this thing, were you editing YAML? Is that what you're doing? Um, so I, I, you need to, to create a YAML file, which is the action YAML file, but then uh -huh. the action itself was actually a Node.js application. Oh, I so see. So I, your I actually, YAML file would call the uh, Node.js. So the YAML actually. file would actually point into that, and I'm using the YAML actually to, to, send, to pass in the parameters. So the action YAML file, for instance, it contains all the... Uh, you know, all the parameters that I'm expecting with the validation and the stuff of thing, you know, and if they are required or not. And then those parameters, once I put them in there, they are going to be passed into my, uh, into my action itself. So the action would actually, uh, would, get, uh, would get those parameters and with the help of the parameters, then I can work with, uh, with, with the things that I need. So for instance, in order for you to connect to a, to a storage account, you would need to have a, um, an account key and maybe an account name. And those are considered to be sensitive things. Sure. So I can either use the account name as if, you know, I can use the account name as a uh, parameter into my action YAML, or I can point those to, to be uh, uh, brought from, a, uh, from, uh, from my secret, you know, from my uh, GitHub secrets. So I can set up a secret and I would say, okay, so the storage account name is that, and it's a secret, so you don't get to see it. And the storage account key is another secret that is stored in, the, in, uh, in GitHub uh, as a secret. And then again, you don't have to see it. So although I have in the open my action, you can't, you can't see the, you know, which storage accounts I'm, I'm going to use and what keys I'm going to use for authenticating those. But then everything is there and then it just does the deployment. That's very cool. Uh, have you shared this code? Yes, it's actually it's open. It, it, it's open source. It's uh, I will I will give you the link actually because it's so yeah it's so it's so straightforward. The one thing that I haven't done I haven't done it in TypeScript. So if you want I mean if you want to start and you have a little bit more complicated action, then you mm -hmm. can just go and say I want to do that in um, you know in TypeScript, um, and then you can you can use the, the you know type safety and all the things so you can. Uh, but uh, I didn't for again uh, because that was such a simple action. I did it th this way. I'm working on a version two of it because what I want to do and what I want to change now is actually the, to give the possibility to use shared access signatures. Right now, I'm using the uh, account key, which means that mm -hmm. I'm you know so if my account key gets leaked and I need to change it, I need to remember to go into the GitHub action and update uh, the the key in there. While if I'm using a shared access signature, even if the you know the the access signature gets leaked, then I can you know I can just. Uh, uh, you know, I, I will either generate a new one, or I can, if I use a, a, a policy-based one, then I can just remove the policy and that's a stored policy, and that's it. So, it, you know, I can I can give that options to, um, to to whoever wants to use it, and and it just works. That's the <laughs> that's the good part. Tell me about when you're when you're figuring out how to uh, create this 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 new GitHub action. What what resources did you use to learn it? Because it sounds like GitHub actions were new to you at the time. Uh, and they're new for a lot of people, and I would right. I would love to say that that was the, the documentation, but it's not. That's the problem. The documentation is still in in its infancy, so okay. it, there are still some things that are lacking and they are not very well explained. I think one of the things. So I'm I'm learning by seeing an example. I'm very good at copying other people's work, you know, and maybe improving into that. But I'm not very good at you know like I sometimes I'm doing a lot of explorations and, and stuff, but. When you have a day job, when you have kids, you know, when you know, I have a small kid at home and I have some older, I have teenagers at, at home, you don't have so much time. And, you know, sometimes you like to have stuff served on a simple platter and just use them as they are, but you, you don't get to do that. So um, I would have loved for the documentation maybe to be a little bit better. And I, I know, you know, you would say, but this is open source. So if you want, you can do it yourself. And that's one of that's the things you that, I, you know, I, exactly. That's one of the things that you want to do. You can do it yourself. Um, but I was looking at other actions. That was one of the, my, my, you know, my, my to go, uh, my to go uh, move. It's always to do reverse engineering. To see what other people were doing, and especially being open source, uh, you know. And I, I, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm quite fluent in reading other people's code, uh, especially if, you know, if it's not too, in, you know, imbricated. If it's, if it's a easy to, to read code, and um, I would say most actions are, you know, quite, uh, quite. Um, uh, quite well done. It makes a lot of sense to go read them, and I will I will give you like the ones that 
were my inspiration were actually the, the one published by the Azure team. So there are a lot of actions that the Azure team published that they are made specifically to interact with, uh, with Azure. So you can create a GitHub action and interact with different services for, for Azure. Um, which led me to another thing. So one of the problems I had once I deployed stuff in my storage account, for instance, and I had that, that connected already to, the, to, the CDN prof, uh, to, to my CDN uh, endpoint, one of the problems I had was that I need to purge the content on the CDN. So in order to do that, I needed to either create another action to do the purging, or actually I could do a simpler, the simpler way was to use an Azure action. And there is an Azure action that you can do a login into, into your own Azure account. And again, you use, instead of using a, um, instead of using username and password, you can use a, um, a SPN, you know, a service, uh, service provider uh, name. So, so when you use the SPN for that, you can, uh, you know, you can give it the, the right permissions. And I created an SPN that can, the, can only do one thing, purge content on the CDN. So even if someone will ever get access to that, cannot do anything than just purging the content in my CDN. So what I what I end up doing was actually to say, okay, so this is what I this is what I you know, my, my next action would be to actually um, um, log into Azure using this is SPN information and then run one single command which is AZ uh, CDN endpoint purge and that's it and it you know and it does it does the purging um, automatically. So when you're done, you know whenever so now the way this this I would uh, um, uh, you know. Uh, structure those kind of things would be in two different ways. So on every pull request, I will do a continuous integration. Mm -hmm. And then on every, you know, um, so and everything runs, then I have no problem whatsoever. And when I'm done with that and I'm doing the push to actually move it into master, for instance, then I will do, or then I will do a, uh, you know, then I will do a continuous deployment kind of thing. So if I went through all the steps and everything looks okay, then I can just take everything and it's deployed into, uh, into production or into staging, depending how you choose to do. But everything now it's 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 done. Uh, we we chose to have two different branches. We have a dev branch. So as soon as you deploy to dev, you know you you push to dev, uh, then it goes it gets deployed into our. Uh, uh, development um, uh, environment, and then when mm -hmm. you uh, when you do a pull request and accept the pull request into master, then it gets deployed, you know, and it gets deployed into the main uh, into the main application. That sounds very clever. And, uh, yeah, and a good good example of problem solving. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so send me that link, and I'll put that in the show notes. I, I have and, two uh, two links. I will, yeah, one with the, the action itself, and one the, how I use the action in in uh, in practice. You know the the, the, the yeah. Great. Before we go, I want to ask you uh, about DevSum. Yeah. Uh, what's the status of DevSum during these crazy times? So we had DevSum this year as a as a virtual uh, conference, and okay. I would say we, we you know we had mixed reviews. Actually, the participants loved it because the content was excellent, but I think the one thing that we missed was you know the interaction with the with the speakers. I think and I, I, and I, I, it's not only DevSum. I think the, the main reason, and I, I feel exactly the same, the main reason everybody, every speaker comes to a conference is for the networking part, you know, the possibility to come that's and right. see other speakers. And, you know, for me, it's a learning experience. That, that's the whole thing. It's, you know, it's one thing to yeah spend an hour listening to something online, but there's a completely different thing if I go out and have a beer with the guy that was doing the show and then talking about all kind of, you know, all kind of learnings and all kind of things that were happening. And that was, you know, that was why I got involved in the DevSum in the first place, because that was a chance for me to make sure that I have a, you know, I have a forum to meet my friends at least once a year. Now, unfortunately, you know, that it's a, it's a global, uh, you know, the situation, it's global now. Uh, everybody has exactly the same issues. I don't think there are any conferences or, you know, any responsible conference organizers, let me put it this way, that will go and say, no, no, we still want to have this in person, like a normal conference, because that would be a big, you know, it would be a big no-no. So uh, we decided to, you know, initially, actually, the decision was to, to move it to, to the fall. But then when we saw the way things are going, we said, you know what, what our, you know, what we are interested in is to make sure that, um, you know, the, the brand is keep alive. Uh, so we, we can keep that brand alive. So that's why we decided to go with the virtual, uh, with the virtual conference. Um, and our lesson was actually we need to find a way to engage with the speakers more. That's the one thing to, to do. Uh, and I think we'll have to make a decision early on now in the, into the fall and see, do we want to do anything next year? 
do you know do we want to risk anything because the biggest challenge we had you know we paid a lot of money for the the, the location sure. but the location said it's not our problem i mean yeah you can come here you are not allowed to be more than 50 people uh but you can come here and you can use that you paid for it so we don't you know so we we not not me because i was i, I mean i had no as you know i had no economical stake into the conference but the problem was that they, they, you know, the, the, the organizer had to pay the, the down payment and they lost the down payment mm -hmm. because of that. So it's, you know, and it's a bit, it's a big, uh, yeah, uh, um, issue for, for them to lose a lot of money like that. So, yeah. yeah. So you're, the big decision will come in the fall as to whether I think so, yeah. I think, well, and, well, and whether yeah. or not it will be in person versus virtual. Exactly. And there will be, I mean, and, and that's, uh, that, that's, I mean, if you do it virtual, you need to do it, you know, you, we need to start, uh, uh, for for you know like long in advance, we need to make sure that people understand that this this is what it it will be. And I know that other conferences like NDC, for instance, they do a much better job at engaging with the speakers and have them present there, and they have a lot of rooms. But uh, to I would say to our defense, <laughs> you know, uh, we had only uh, we had only three weeks to to put everything up together, and we chose a different format. We chose the, the format that we had a live studio. You know, and then before or in between every session, we had interviews with specialists and some of the speakers, you know, after their session, they would stay put for another 10 minutes. But I think one of the, you know, one of the ideas I had, if we organize stuff like that in the future, we need to have a little bit more time in between sessions and we need to allow the speaker to stay on because right now they are doing 45 minutes and that's it. They're, they're done. Everybody needs to move to the next session or they have five, 10 minutes just to bring more coffee and then move to the next session. But if we leave half an hour or maybe even more between sessions where you can sit there and talk with the speaker, you know, and everybody would have an open mic, then I think that might be much, uh, you know, much more appealing, both from, from a, you know, from an interaction point of view and from, you know, how can you make people, uh, yeah, being part of that. Interesting idea. Well, I hope, I hope it comes back in something close to what you were before, because I've been to death some three times and I've just had a fantastic time every single time I've been. Uh, we so again we so Dev Sum is not going anywhere. We are still going to do Dev Sum, but we don't know when it will be the next one in person right. because you know because nobody knows anything at the moment. So that's you know Absolutely. everybody's in the same in the same boat. Tibby, thank you so much for your time, and you and your family, yeah. please stay safe. Davies, thank you for having me. I really love the technology because it allows me to be connected with my friends.